Amos Humiston, the Unidentified Soldier of Gettysburg. Amos Humiston was born on April 26, 1830 in Owego, New York. He married a young woman named Philinda Smith and the couple had three children, Frank, Alice, and Frederick. In the late 1850s, the family moved to Portville in Cattaraugus County where Amos worked as a harness maker. Amos did not enter the war right away as many younger men in his county had. He was in his 30s and had a family to take care of. He, however, did end up joining on September 24, 1862. He became a volunteer in Company C of the 154th New York Volunteer Infantry when President Lincoln called for 500,000 more men to join the fight. Unfortunately, he did not experience much of the war. He was only in two battles before his death on July 1, 1863 in Gettysburg, Pennsylvania. Humiston's division was being surrounded by Confederate soldiers when orders to withdraw had not reached his commander. He fought bravely as the enemy flanked them, but soon Humiston was shot above his heart. As he bled out, his last action was to stumble out into a vacant lot with a photograph of his three children in hand. This dying man lay on the ground, clutching this photograph, and soon death surrounded him with only the image of his children in mind. Some time after the battle, his body was discovered. As his corpse was placed in an unmarked grave, his photograph found its way into the hands of a man who recognized it as the only way to identify him, Dr. John Francis Burns. Burns brought this photograph to the attention of the public with several descriptions posted in several newspapers. He offered copies to any families that recognized that description. Soon the article reached Felinda, who had not re received any letters from her husband since Gettysburg. Burns personally delivered the blood-stained photo to the family, and with one look, she knew she was a widow and her children orphans. Amos Humiston's sad death was not in vain, however. Burns used the proceeds of the story to fund a charity for orphaned families of the war. He set up orphanages and schools around the country to support these families. Felinda and her children moved to one of those homes, and Felinda became the headmistress to wa to wit while her children got a college education there. With Amos Humiston reburied outside the building, she had only to look out the window to be reminded of her brave husband. The truth behind this man's story may be sad, but it is a wonderful depiction of what Civil War families may have gone through, especially those families that never discovered what happened or were never given the body of their loved one. Amos Humiston's death led to the education of his children and support to thousands of other families, most without closure. His sacrifice was an honorable thing, and today we do honor it. We thank Amos Humiston for his service to our country and find a sad comfort in it. Thousands of unidentified, unidentified soldiers with stories very close, if not the same as Humiston, lay in unmarked graves across Gettysburg. Remember them. Imagine their families without closure. Imagine their friends left unknowing. Remember their sacrifices to our country. Imagine the bravery in the final breaths of men thousands of miles away from their homes and their families. Imagine, remember, and honor not only Amos Humiston, but every fallen soldier and every one of their families. Okay, that being said, I'll give you the high sign when to start, but Carolyn's going to tell you about this, the right flank of the Union Army. If you look over Bill Ostrander, that's Oak Hill back there. We stood on the edge of that precipice. You can see the peace light. So this is that right flank we saw from up there and all this ground in between. All right, Carolyn, you ready? Yes, I am. On Thank three, you. two, and one. Welcome to Barlow's No, Lacusta. This is uh, the pretty much the right flank of the Union Army. It is held by the 11th Corps. Um, every monument on the battlefield has a Corps symbol. Now, your Wisconsin people, your six Wisconsin people, is First Corps, and that is the circle. 11th Corps is the crescent moon. So every monument you see on the battlefield is going to have a core symbol. So we are the 11th Corps, and this is the 1st Division, and the division commander is Francis Barlow. He's 28 years old. And this corps and the 1st Corps are going to do all the fighting 
day one. I'm a 17th Connecticut person, but we're going to talk about 17th. This is the 153rd Pennsylvania. They are a German regiment, and we're going to talk about the 4th U.S. Battery Company G. So those are the three things we're going to talk about up here. This core starts at Emmitsburg. And that morning, General Howard issues marching orders, and they march from Emmitsburg and by the time they get almost all the way down the Emmitsburg Road to the edge of town, they know they are marching toward battle because the guns of Oak Hill are booming. The first day's battlefield is booming. They come down Washington Avenue, which we just drove down, uh, and the townspeople are just absolutely relieved to see the Union Army coming through and the townspeople get out water and all kinds of food. And as the guys are marching toward this end of the field, north of town, the townspeople are trying to hand them water, uh, ladle them water, ladle them, you know, hand out food to them. These guys are really hungry, they're really thirsty. They've come 11 miles from Emmitsburg without any water because the orders are no one stops. So all of the officers of these regiments, including the 17th, I mean, you care about your men, 17th Connecticut, Lieutenant Colonel Douglas Fowler, they're coming in from Emmitsburg. One of the 17th Connecticut guys stops and dips a cup in the stream, in one of those tin metal Civil War cups that they all carry, and he is immediately arrested by General Barlow. So he's ordered to hand in his sword and get to the back of the line. The regiment is furious. And they're like, we're not going into battle unless you're with us. And he's like, calm down, guys. No worries. I'll be there. Well, sure enough, they're marching toward the sound of the guns. And all those officers that are under arrest are released to lead their men. So they come up here. Now, this 17th Connecticut is, that position is, you know, all these positions are pretty fluid. Nobody knows why Barlow comes out here. He literally breaks the Union line. I think I know why he comes out here. He's supposed to be down there. His line is supposed to be down there. And the line is supposed to be connected to the 1st Corps on one side and the 11th Corps on the other. But he creates a salient by marching this far out onto this knoll. And this is a problem because if you know anything about a salient, what happens with a military salient, you are immediately in a vulnerable position. And you can be attacked on three sides. Now this had recently happened in May at Chancellorsville to these same guys, these poor 17th Connecticut. So what happens? Barlow rolls him out here. He's a very aggressive guy, very aggressive. When he follows his troops in, there's no straggling, there's no stopping. He carries that heavy uh, saber, and he is known to whack anyone straggling on the back with his saber. He is a tough 28-year-old. Fearless, but difficult. And he doesn't like Germans. So he's got a problem right there. So he rolls him out. I think, we'll never know for sure, he never gets taken to task for this like Dan Sickles, who does the same thing in the Peach Orchard, which you'll see tomorrow. Um, but Barlow rolls him right out here. I think he's thinking artillery platform, which it's a great artillery platform, but it makes them tremendously vulnerable. At first, these four guns, this is a 19-year-old Lieutenant Wilkinson, Battery B, uh, Battery G, um, U.S. Artillery, and they are dueling with the guns on Oak Hill. And he's doing a great job. He's on a horse, one of the few mounted officers, he's on a horse. They are dueling with the guns on Oak Hill. There's also uh, artillery fire coming in from this direction. There's a Lutheran, uh, I call it the old age home, but there's guns placed down there. Uh, I think it's Jenkins, or uh, Jones or Jenkins. I think it's Jones. And, and this over here, these guns have to swing this way, the way they're facing now, 
because Jubal Early comes down the Harrisburg Road. Kind of takes them all by surprise. This whole knoll is going to be engulfed in a vice. The Confederates outnumber them three, three and a half to one. These guys make a gallant stand. This regiment, this German regiment, some of them thought their nine months were up, but they committed to come to Gettysburg anyway. They were gonna fight anyway. But many of them really believed their, their time was up. They were nine month regiment. It really had a few more days to run. You know, the little Civil War record keeping mistake in here. But these guys do the best they can. 153rd, they're down along below the hill. Now, here's another mistake. We're on the top of the hill. We're not on the military perimeter where your cannon are more effective, where you can actually see the bottom of the hill. So we're way up here and that has some advantages. Of course, if you're long range artillery, it's great. But if you're getting swarmed, you can't depress your guns down to anti-personnel level, okay? We're gonna see this again on East Cemetery Hill if we get there. So anyway, Jubal Early comes this way. Doles is sweeping this way. The Georgians start to come off the road, come across Rock Creek, and they literally engulf these guys. These guys run because they're down on the bottom and they are overwhelmed. So they start pushing up the hill and some of them do break. The 17th Connecticut and the Ohio boys are in, are in reserve. You can look at the sign there. They're in reserve behind the guns. Anna Wilkinson is being very effective. This 19 year old is on a horse and he's directing fire extremely effectively. There is some, we don't know if he was specifically targeted or what, but John Gordon's coming up the Harrisburg Road. And this officer, he knows he's got to down that officer, lessen the effect of these guns. And Wilkinson is struck in the leg, knocked off his horse. I believe the horse is killed. There's an old myth that this young 19 year old tourniquets his own leg and amputates it or finishes amputating what's hanging by a ligament or a thread, so to speak. He is dragged away to the county almshouse, which is the poor house, which immediately becomes one of the first hospitals on this field. The almshouse is that set of buildings right there. Do you see it over there? The almshouse came down in, in, in 1960 or 61, I believe. This is the cemetery for the almshouse. It's the poor house cemetery. The indigent, the poor, the insane all go to the almshouse, okay? So the county takes care, it's a progressive county. They try to take care of the people that need care. I mean, it's not an ideal environment. It's a tough environment. You know, you're talking like Victorian era. So but they do try. It's a big farm complex. There's a bunch of buildings and um, that becomes one of the first hospitals. So Wilkinson gets dragged there. Uh, maybe he's thrown in a blanket, they take him there, and he is going to die there. We'll come back and tell the, well, I'll tell the rest of the story now. Battle is raging up here. Battle is raging. Regiments are breaking. Confederates are pushing them up the hill, pushing them that way. Barlow, doesn't like Germans anyway, is pretty angry that they broke. And he's trying to rally them when he's hit three times. He's dragged away. The Confederates do, they look, you, know, you see those, those stars on his sleeves. They drag him into the woods or into the trees. It's not a lot of woods up here. Although this was an oak grove at the time. And they lay him down in the leaves. Later, Union prisoners from the farm, there's a better farm across the creek here. You can't see it, you certainly could then. Uh, supposedly, General Gordon has him. Should I take over here? Taken care of, yes, All you right. can say that. So what we like to do is separate fact myth from legend, if you can say myth and legend from fact. And 
some of the best stories of the Civil War probably weren't even true. And the meeting of uh, Barlow and Gordon here probably is one of those myths that makes a good story, but there wasn't any, any substance to it. So the story goes that John Gordon rides up here hearing that there's possibly a wounded Union general and he comes up here and he ministers, he gives aid to General Barlow. And assuming he's going to die, because he's pretty shot up, yes. right? Yes. Terribly shot up. And then he has to lead to conduct his troops into battle toward Gettysburg. Well, after the war, supposedly the two men meet up again in um, Washington, D.C., somewhere out east. And uh, they start talking, they start swapping war stories. And the saying or the story goes something like this. Uh, John Gordon says that aren't you the Barlow I killed at Gettysburg? And supposedly they had this big, you know, let's hug meeting after the war. And the meeting probably occurred and the stories were swapped, but probably John Gordon never actually administered aid to a, a wounded federal officer. Why tell a story like that? You know, what are your thoughts? Say them and I'll repeat them for the camera. Why would a, such a story get born out of the mayhem right here on Barlow's Knoll? Well after the war. Unity. Peace is good. Yeah. To prove that peace is good. Okay, peace is good. The brothers are reuniting. That kind of idea. It was the beginning of CNN. <laughs> that one won't be repeated, even though he said the beginning of CNN. Stop it, Kenneth. Okay. And it probably had to do with that that there was an effort at re reunification. But again, I believe too, every one of these officers was kind of creating their own mini legends. And in those mini legends, they were always the heroes, the good guys, the victims who survived through thick and thin. Carolyn, take it away. Well, 28 year old Francis Barlow is told he's mortally wounded. They drag him down to another field hospital. You know, this is a world where every barn, every house becomes a hospital. Drag him down there, the Confederates do administer aid. Another hallmark of the Civil War is once you're wounded, you will become a non-combatant and both sides will pitch in to treat you. Okay, so that's, you know, this is warfare in the 19th century. Once you're wounded, you're no longer the enemy and we're gonna help you if we can taken down to the Benner farm. Confederate surgeons probe his wounds under anesthesia. He's told General, you're mortally wounded, and he believes it. He had been mortally wounded at Antietam, and his wife, Arabella, had nursed him back to health. Same thing's gonna happen here, and we'll tell that a little more about that. So he winds up down at the Benner farm down there. That house catches artillery fire. There's still a shell in the back of it. It, uh, it catches fire, um, they put the fire out, full of Union and Confederate wounded, including high-ranking General Barlow. This is John Gordon. So what happens up here? It's not a good situation. These guys are outnumbered three, three and a half. It's hard to tell with numbers. And the Confederates just swarm them. And it's a lot of hand-to-hand. -hand. The 17th and the 75th Ohio sister regiments, they try to make a stand, but it's impossible. And this place is such a mess. It's hand to hand. John Gordon, again, General Gordon, again, is going to say he witnesses a Yankee flag bearer and a Confederate flag bearer go at it. And he's never gonna get names or name names, but there's no reason to disbelieve him. Union gets pushed back. They try to make a stand at the alms house. They try to form another line. But again, you know, numbers are overwhelming and they get pushed, pushed back right into town. And we're gonna go down that Stratton Street where the mural is, is called the pathway to safety. And these Union guys start to flee through town with Confederates in pursuit. And uh, some of them are going to get trapped in alleys. Some of them are going to try to hide in cellars and houses. Some of them are going to get through and they're going to form that famous line on East Cemetery Hill. Now, let me tell you a couple of stories about my guys here. 
This is a regiment, 17th Connecticut. Four companies, before the real bang-a-bang -bang starts, are dispatched across Rock Creek under a major called Brady. They form in the orchard behind that Benner house. So you have six more companies up here. So it's way down in numbers right away. Brady is going to be the farthest Yankee unit out on, on that end. And finally, he gets orders to withdraw because they're getting overwhelmed up here. And as one author calls him, that wily Yankee, he gets those four companies out and down, and they go through town. At one point, they're fighting in the streets. They're volleying in the streets, and he gets them up to East Cemetery Hill. Now, for these guys up here, they've got a lieutenant colonel called Douglas Fowler, who had just been appointed, just been promoted. And Fowler, he's the guy that got arrested by General Barlow for letting the guy dip the cup in. And uh, he's back at the head of the regiment. They released him from arrest, comes to the head of his regiment. He won't get off his horse. Very, very common theme in Gettysburg. You know, the men must see us today. He's not getting off his horse. The officers, his officers beg him to get off the horse and lead them on foot. He won't do it. So he comes up, the regiment is in resistance behind, you can look in that map there, and the, the ordinance starts flying. And he's joking with them, you know, you got a lot of young guys, they're 18, 19, 20 years old, they're like the kids I used to have in high school. And he says, hey, dodge the big ones, boys, you know, trying to joke with them and all of that. Finally, it really starts getting hot up here shell shells bursting uh they're getting pushed by the enemy they stand they try to volley they really try to make it happen and all of a sudden fowler is decapitated goes forward 17th he holds out his sword and he's decapitated by a shell probably his blood and his brains go all over his adjutant and the guys get pushed pushed, pushed. They do try to reform there. Fowler's down. Captain Moore, another beloved captain, Company C, he's down. He's shot in the head twice. The lead is flying up here. Many, many spectacular wounds. It's terrible. They drag these guys to the almshouse. They drag these guys down to Benner. And it's all over pretty quickly up here, within an hour doesn't take an hour three to maybe four that's it and they're out of here they try to save Fowler's body uh, three of his guys try dragging them then two of them try dragging them then I think they get him as far as what they call the almshouse run which is a brook and um, they have to drop them they're all bloody they're all it's just a terrible situation the dead up here are gonna lie for at least two or three days. Ironically, the 17th Connecticut on July 4th, the morning of July 4th, now bear in mind, you could see a lot of what was up here from East Cemetery Hill. They are gonna be the first regiment back up here. They liberate all the prisoners at the almshouse. They come up here, they're looking for their dead. Most of the dead are stripped, they're bloated. The Confederates have tried to bury some of them and uh, they look for Fowler and they never ever locate his body and they really try. People come from Connecticut to open the mass graves up here. They can't find them. They really, really want to uncover their, their dead. It's just like, just like now. We want to bring our boys home. You see it in the paper every day. There's an agency, the DPAA, um, De Department of M-I-A-P-O-W Accounting Agency. They still look for dead today. If you look in the news and you're going to look in the news, you're going to see guy from World War II comes home to honors. Guy from Korea comes home. They're very active. But it's no different in Victorian America, maybe more so. They want closure. They want their boys to come home.
One note about the Civil War Army, the government does not notify families in the event of a soldier's death. You don't know unless a comrade writes or a company officer writes home or somebody witnesses that there are so many unknown dead from the Civil War. It's one of the great tragedies of the United States or America. So that supposedly marks the spot where a Colonel uh, Captain Moore is killed. And this supposedly marks the spot where Colonel Fowler is killed. This monument is erected in 1884. In 1885, the veterans come here and they erect a wooden flagpole. Now you can tell that's not a wooden flagpole. It's going to go down in the 1890s from a storm and it's going to be replaced with the, this current flagpole is from the 1920s, but it's going to be replaced with a metal flagpole. Farmer Benner is going to be contracted with the regiment and he is going to raise the flag here on all kinds of occasions. So Farmer Benner trudges up the hill and raises the flag for 4th of July and Decoration Day and anytime there's a dedication on the field. And in 1889, when they dedicate, this regiment dedicates their second monument on East Cemetery Hill, which maybe we'll see, um, they come back and they honor him with a beautiful plaque and, you know, a lot of, lot of hoopla at the um, second dedication. So again, you can't really see what's going on here, but in 1863, the view sheds were open and this was just a horrific mess. But keep in mind, salients. Salients are a bulge in a military line. Not a good thing in, in the military world. Okay, some quick questions. Okay, uh, what was the weather like on July 1st, 1863 here? It was hot and muggy, and it rained that morning as the guys were coming in from Emmitsburg, and many of them reported that their guns misfired. Okay. And were they in the hot wool uniforms? Yes, they too? were, sir. And uh, how long did it take to walk or march from Emmitsburg uh, to here? They left Emmitsburg around 7 or, again, time during the Civil War. Right. They didn't synchronize their watches. But they left there about 7 or 8 o'clock in the morning. They marched the, it's approximately 11 or 12 miles. They marched out to here, and, uh, and um, it took them quite a while. They get here. That sign there, again, time is difficult in the Civil War, but they probably start intensely fighting around 3 o'clock. Okay. Casey. If they never found Fowler's body, then how do they have a monument as to where he was killed? Well, the, many, many of the men would come back here. In 1884, the spring of 1884, when they were going to put that monument up, that, that's the monument right there, they came back and they scoped the place out. And, um, you know, it didn't look the same, okay? There was an oak grove here and there was an oak tree, a, a witness, an oak witness tree there that had come down in a storm. So most of the guys that were scoping out the location for the monument, they agreed it was here, maybe they were close, and they all dug in the roots of the tree and they all took pieces home so that they could make little trinkets out of. And there was a gentleman with them, Private Levi Dixon. He had lost his leg. He had really been blown up here. They dragged him, I believe, although he never gives a name because these guys don't know all the farms. They're from Connecticut. I believe they dragged him down to Benner Farm. I have some reason to believe that. They dragged him to Benner Farm and uh, a Confederate surgeon amputated his leg. And he is one of the locating committees that comes up here and the Stamford Advocate interviews him when he gets back. This is May of 1884. The monument's dedicated July 1st, 1884 in commemoration of the first day of the battle. And he gives this lengthy interview. And um, that's where I get my information. So, so I Dixon, 19 year old, loses a leg up here, 
remembers that house, remem remembers the bridge across Rock Creek. So that's where I get that information. So I witness veterans returning here, going on memory. But like uh, John Michael Priest said yesterday, a traumatic event like this is burned into your memory. So we can rely on, on some of what they say, more so sub supposedly than some of the written records that were penned by the generals. Ken. Uh, no, no. These no, guns were never captured. A battery, a Union battery is usually six guns. Um, uh, Wilkeson has two detached guns under Lieutenant Merkel. They're out that way. They, I think Merkel does lose one gun. But these guns, these aren't the exact guns, but we know that they are Civil War cannon by the serial numbers. And uh, what he does was they hitch him up. They hitch him up, and they, they take him through town. They do save the guns. Okay, I didn't know. I was wondering yep. if they had a rope yep. from the guns. Or, uh... Yeah, yeah. They do save these guns, and, um, and they get him out to East Cemetery Hill, and they do fight again. Paul? So are you say like they were overrun, or they were forced to retreat, or, you know, like all those, all those terminology, like where is that decision-making coming from? Are there... You know, like you hear about generals making decisions, yeah. like, obviously, is that coming from, like, that, who's making the decision, like, you need to... At, at the point that they had to turn around and get over to the Alms House, he's down, he's down, he tried to rally him, he's really wounded. And then it devolves into the companies. So you have a couple of regiments here, the 17th and the 75th. Colonel Harris, the 75th, he's going to become governor of Ohio. He's here. These guys know by sight these. General Ames, who takes over for Barlow, he's already trying to form a line down there, a, a secondary line down there at the, at the almshouse. So who makes the decision? Well, sometimes it becomes every man his own general. And don't forget those colors. How do Civil War guys know where to go how do they communicate you follow those colors and you don't let anybody capture them and so that's part of it they follow their colors you see the colors go you go with them now presumably somebody's giving orders to the color bearers but in a combat like this which i can't even describe how messy it is how chaotic how you just think you got you got artillery shrieking you know, the noise of these battles, these guys at the end of the battle, there's, uh, you know, the guys uh, out on um, the Emmitsburg Road, out on uh, the high water mark and all that, for days after the battle, they're all screaming at each other because they don't hear. They can't hear. All their air drums are blown out. These are the kind of things nobody talks about. So you have chaos. You have smoke. You can't see. Um, it's just impossible. So who makes the decision? Well, they try to maintain command and control. The flags are certainly crucial, but you know what? At, at a certain time, it's like D-Day on the seawall. Every man becomes his own general. And if one guy gets up and another guy follows, or one guy turns around and tries to form a line, and they do the best they can. And some... Yes, often, often. I'll, I'll tell you, Company D here, um, these guys take a lot of casualties. And that's not the prisoners that get taken. But by the time they get to C uh, Cemetery Hill, I have a lot of first-hand accounts. Poor Company D, they have one lieutenant and they have one corporal left. And, you know, that's it. And uh, they are really, they really take a shellacking. One, real one more question, Kay. The, before the kids were asking about the cannons, I think you can see here how they can be, yeah. you know, it's not by sight, but No, by it's the, the screw. Yeah. It's so, the screw. Yeah. And, and, and Bayard Wilkinson, he's 19 years old, he's really putting a dent in him. I started to say, Gordon comes down at the head of his Georgians, and there is, here's another more Civil War hearsay, but you know, maybe they did target Wilkinson. He looks at that officer commanding these cannon and he knows this kid's good. Some people say, Gordon says, I want him down. Take him down. And he gets taken down.
And he's a very prominent target anyway, whether he's targeted or not. But of course, you're always going to go, look, you got an artillery battery that's re really being effective. You know what you go for? The officers and the horses. That, I mean, that's what you do. I mean, over on, uh, what's the farm? On um, the uh, farm where Sickles gets shot. And Crossle. Bigelow has to prolong his cannon. And what that means is the horses are down. Yeah, Trussell Farm. The horses are down. Well, you got to get the guys, get them out of there. And they start to what they call prolong the cannon. And there's a huge recoil on these too. So if you got to fight to fight your guns to the end, you fight your guns to the end. You keep firing. It jumps. The guys pull it back some more while they're loading. They load again, and then you know it's just it's a it's quite a process. Something none of us can envision. None of us can envision. All right, let's end it right there. Glad suffer. Well, Union guns couldn't elevate high enough to fire in the Confederates. And so the North launched attack after bloody attack from the landward side of the Vicksburg defenses. Yet these attacks couldn't drive the rebel forces from the high ground. Finally, the Union laid siege to Vicksburg and subjected her to a continuous bombardment, which eventually led to the surrender of that city on July 4th, 1863. Throughout history, one principle of warfare, including here at Gettysburg, has been to hold the high ground. Often whoever holds the high ground wins the battle. The same applies to us as Christians. When we walk in integrity, honesty, purity, and love, we are maintaining the high ground. We may not compromise or give up on the high ground, for if we lose it, we begin to lose the battle. Fight to hold on to good character, so when people look to you, they see Christ's example in your life. As they see you an example of Christ's love, may others be drawn to that same love and salvation he provided on a high ground called cavalry. Calvary. We pray. Lord, be with us as we learn more about Gettysburg and the Civil War today, but also as we see the examples of men of valor who held to their high ground and their principles. Help us, O Lord, to do the same. Amen. So here we are, Wakusa Lutheran Grade School Campaign 2021 on the fields at Gettysburg. There's a series of ridges that lead behind us here along Highway 30 today was called the Chambersburg Bike Pike back in the day. General John Buford, who is a hero of one of our good friends, David Neekum. David, you made the cut. Anyway. John Buford and about 3,000 cavalry are told to try to stop the rebels south of town. They know Union infantry is coming up on the Emmitsburg Road, which would be crossing in front of the round tops. That'll be part of our story later on. But Buford is in kind of a pickle here. Early in the war, he had tried to hold some ground and the infantry did not arrive in time to give him the support he needed. And so he's going to do his duty here. All the while in the back of his mind is the thought that if that infantry doesn't come up, I'm going to sacrifice lives for nothing. A couple miles down the road is a marker called the first shot marker. Ephraim Wister House? Whistler. Whistler, okay. And there a young man named Marcellus Jones has established a picket post. Pickets, of course, were scouts out in front of the army. They were supposed to see where the infantry is coming, who is where. Union Cavalry at Gettysburg does a fairly good job. Well, Marcellus Jones is back a little ways, and one of his pickets rides up and tells him Confederates are coming down the road. So Jones rides up to that same picket post. He borrows a carbine, a single shot, sharps carbine, from a man who turns out to have been his cousin. And he decides that I'm going to just launch a bullet in their direction. Why would you do that? You guys tell me. 
What's the marching order for a Civil War army? How do they march up the road? Mo. Columns of four. Thank you, Moses. And so they're marching in columns of four. When that gun goes off, the Confederates don't know who's waiting up ahead of them. They hear gunfire and they immediately deploy from columns of four into line of battle. You have to shake thousands of men into ranks too deep. And that line of battle will then sweep forward to see what the opposition is ahead of them. Again, the ground matters, doesn't it? Look this way, look behind you. You can't see what's there. And so a prudent commander is not going to leave his troops in that marching order. Instead, he's going to form line of battle so as not to risk his command. Every time this happens on a series of three to four ridges from that direction, Hare's Ridge, McPherson's Ridge, Seminary Ridge, it's always going to force the Confederates to slow down. And that is going to be the game that John Buford is playing here. John Buford wants to buy time for the infantry to come up. Now the cavalry has a single shot carbine. It loads from the back, from the breech, loads much faster than a muzzle loading musket. A good soldier can fire two to three times a minute. A carbine can load faster, but there's two problems. The range is a little shorter, but also every fourth man is going to be a horse holder. What is that? Loudly, Casey. Um, isn't that the person that stays behind to hold the horses? They're going to stay behind to hold the horses so that the cavalry can get up and go if they have to. So the 3,000 men that Buford has here are automatically reduced by approximately 25%. Now, Buford holds these rebels back for quite a while. And, as I said earlier, he has that, that panic in the back of his mind that what if the infantry don't come up? Buford loved his boys, okay? He loved his men. And he wasn't about to sacrifice them needlessly, yet he is also a man who wants to follow his duty. In my opinion, John Buford was one of the top cavalry commanders of the war. Unfortunately, though he survives Gettysburg, he does not survive the war, dies in 1863 of disease. So, I'd like to read something to you. On June 30th, 1863, Buford led the 3,000 men of his 1st Cavalry Division into the town of Gettysburg looking for the enemy. Well, he knows they're coming from the west. They're also coming from the north. But, the troops he's facing under the command of a man named Harry Heath. Harry Heath is under orders not to bring on a general engagement. General Lee does not want that. And that's going to be part of our story later on in Culp's Hill as well. But Buford wants to slow these men down. And our story goes on. When the skirmishers fire... Robert E. Lee deploys his men, and a man named Tom Devon, who's up in this area as well, a Union, Union uh, colonel, Colonel Tom Devon, he uh, thinks that he can hold the rebels back. He doesn't think this is whole core of the Army of Northern Virginia coming this way. John Buford says differently. This is one of my favorite quotes from Gettysburg. He says, you're not going to be holding them back. No, you won't. They will attack you in the morning, and they will come booming. Skirmishers three deep. You'll have to fight like the devil until support arrives. And so Buford's going to employ this technique of defense in depth. Give ground to gain time. That makes sense, right? If the rebels have to form that line of battle, redeploy, it takes time to move into those formations. And so... On ridge after ridge after ridge, his dismounted cavalry, remember, lessened by the 25% because of the horse holders, is going to fight a tremendous delaying action here. It had to be a hard thing, remembering historically what had happened to him earlier in the war when his men did not get the help they needed in time. If you look back over your shoulders, you see the steeple, to the right of it, behind some trees and a little bit out of, out of sight, 
is the Lutheran Seminary Cupola. It is going to be the round-topped cupola. Not original. The original was destroyed, but it's rebuilt to the original wartime appearance. And in that cupola, imagine being that high up in the air. You can see this field of battle. And that's where John Buford is. He's looking this way, managing the battle like a, a chess player would manage the board. And finally he looks down, and there he sees John Reynolds, who is the commander of the First Corps. He's bringing up several Union brigades. Cutler! Solomon Meredith is bringing up the vaunted Iron Brigade, which of course I give kudos to for saving the nation here on July 1st. Okay, those of us boys, some Indianians, and they have since been joined by the 24th Michigan. The 24th Michigan signs up after Antietam, where we were yesterday, to replace the heavy, heavy losses suffered in the cornfield. Okay, when those uh, 24th Michigan boys arrive, they get a very cool reception. Why? Because the veterans in their ragged uniforms and their beat up black hats look at these new uniforms in front of them and they suggest you have not earned that black hat. Well, when we talk later on today, the 24th Michigan earns their hats on this day, July 1st, 1863. Defense in depth, let me read this to you. From that seminary cupola, Buford surveyed the battle from the tower of the Lutheran Seminary on a nearby ridge. It seemed there was no end to the rebel forces, and without infantry, he knew his delaying action here would be doomed. He sent messengers to apprise John Reynolds of the situation, to encourage him to hurry up. Meanwhile, the numerically superior Confederate riflemen and artillery were hammering Buford's thin line and taking a heavy toll. When he received words of Buford's position, Reynolds gallops up here with just a few aides with him, leaving his uh, infantry behind. He sees Buford up on the tower, reins in his horse and says, what's the matter, John? To which Buford shouted, there's the devil to pay. He filled Reynolds in, whereupon Reynolds sent off a note to Meade, reading, now these are John Reynolds' words, I will fight the enemy inch by inch. And if driven into the town, I will barricade the streets and hold him back as long as possible. And all of that is done, why? Because John Reynolds has recognized that high ground south of town is the key to holding this area. These ridges, okay, while they're good defensive ground, they can easily be flanked. I don't believe Reynolds knew Confederates were coming from the north as well. You think he did? Yeah. Buford's going to picket all of the roads to the north, uh, northeast. So all of the roads, you know there's 12, some, some people say 12, some people say 10, because of all the forks in the road coming into town. Buford's going to have all this picketed. Okay. Almost every road we go to on the first day, we're going to pass a bunch of them. The Harris, he's got them all picketed. So he only has a small group here. And they are, de they are defense and death, and they're coming. He, they pretty quickly realized that they got a core coming toward them. These 3,000 guys got a core coming toward them. They're outnumbered heavily, okay, is what we're saying. Yeah. And yes, thank you for that. Buford's got a thin screen, so he does know they're coming, but he's got to hold that ground south of town. Holding the high ground is going to be important. We have not yet been up to Little Round Top or uh, Cemetery Hill. You're going to see when we get there how incredibly this ground commands the lower ground below it. So, the statue back here is John Reynolds. Here we see John Buford looking off stoically into the distance, planning his defense. And these four cannon barrels, which are called tubes, are the original tubes that were on this ridge in July 1863. How do they know that? Every tube is marked with a number, and those tubes, you have to go over there and touch them at least, okay, after we're done here. Uh, those tubes are witnesses to the fighting that occurred here. Any questions, ladies and gentlemen? Paul.
does it come about that the Confederates are coming from the north? And, you know, you would expect them to be coming from the south. Yep. After the Battle of Fredericksburg led to the Battle of Antietam, eventually led, leads to the Battle of Chancellorsville. And Chancellorsville is where we talked about Joseph Hooker missing a big chance possibly to do damage to Lee's army. At Chancellorsville, he loses Stonewall Jackson, which maybe comes into play here quite a bit. But what Lee said afterwards was that his army, if properly led, is equal to any of the best troops in the world. So that's one answer to your question. I'll get there, Paul. He believed his army was unstoppable if properly led. That led him also to want to get his army, just like Antietam, out of the south for the second time in the war. This will become the second invasion that Lee makes. He has full authority from Jeff Davis, the president of the Confederacy, to do this. I don't believe he comes up there to gain troops for his army. He learned that in the Atenium campaign that probably wasn't going to work. But his troops cross the rivers and they come into this land of milk and honey. They cannot believe what these Pennsylvania farmers have in their barns. They can't believe the largesse. They can't believe the foodstuffs. And so he's going to resupply his army, meanwhile taking the war out of Virginia to give it a chance to recuperate. As he heads north, the Army of the Potomac is given orders to stay between Lee and Lincoln, to be a blocking force to Washington, D.C. And so as that happens and Lee is moving north, the Army of the Potomac is trailing him being a blocking force protecting the capital. They didn't know where Lee was going. Was it Harrisburg? Was it Baltimore? Where was it? So they wanted to be in a position to react after Lee made his intentions known. Other questions? That was a good one, Paul. <laughs> and a long answer. General Longwind here, folks. Anybody else? Now, Carolyn, if you're going to add something, go ahead, but speak into the microphone. I just want to say it's a civil war. Nobody really knows where anybody is. They're all, the armies are literally feeling for each other. They know there's going to be a conflict. Neither Meade nor Lee deliberately wants to fight here at Gettysburg. But because of the road system in southern Pennsylvania, it's the perfect place to concentrate an army. So both of them are heading in this direction and Gettysburg is basically going to become a meeting engagement here rather than a deliberate place to fight. Let's dispel a myth right away too, okay? The myth that the Confederates who are barefoot and in rags are going to Gettysburg to get shoes. Uh-uh. Nope. Actually, infantry, Confederate infantry had been in Gettysburg and they pulled back because Lee has given his commander strict orders, do not bring on a general engagement. As Carolyn said, they were blind here, partly because Jeb Stewart is not available to General Lee. That's being kind, isn't it? Not available. And so Lee goes into this fight basically blind. Whereas the Union Cavalry is here scouting and picketing to the north and west, Lee has no idea where anybody is. And again, you look at the lay of this land, you can hide a few people in these little swales and valleys. Kay, you had a question. I do. This isn't a huge town on the map. 2,400. Okay, but they're like Harrisonburg or, or whatever the name is. Close by. Harrisburg. Harrisburg, okay. That's much bigger. But this had the, the highway. This, had the this road was system. The, the reason yep. they came this way. Yep. Was because of the highway, right? See, okay. so what happens is happen? Lee's looking for a place to concentrate his army. He looks on a map of southern Pennsylvania. Same thing today. You look on a map of southern Pennsylvania. It really, a lot of roads lead to Gettysburg. So Lee, the, probably on the 26th or 27th, Lee is looking for a place to concentrate his army. Because the army is disparate. They, you can't, the land has to support the army. You can't have an army come down one road. It just doesn't work. 
So he's looking for a place to concentrate his army, looks on a map, he goes, perfect place to bring the army together. Le uh, Meade is in the south, he's coming north, he knows that the, the southern army, the army of the northern Virginia is somewhere north of him, he's not sure where, he looks for a place to concentrate his army, looks on the map, starts to bring everybody together on the roads to Gettysburg. So that, that's the, that was what they were both looking for, a place to concentrate in the event of a battle, which was a meeting engagement and occurred here. And even on the first day's fighting, uh, a lot of Lee's troops aren't up here yet. Well, neither, They're still coming in on the roads and right. Union troops as well, the 6th Corps. Uh, they're way behind. They're way behind, yeah. You got the 1st Corps, your Black Hats and all those guys. You got Huzzah. the 1st Corps and you got the 11th Corps. Those are the only corps that are going to do fighting the first the first day. Good fighting. Good. Good fighting. fighting. Yep. Okay. Any other questions? Otherwise, we'll shut down here, and I'll tell you what's next. Question. How do you know what the numbers are for sure? Uh, Caliph, Caliph, uh, uh, Buford's artillery chief. When they're going to put that monument up, he goes. He goes through. Uh, he goes to all the old arsenals and surplus and everything, and he searches those guns out. And you can see what the, the, the gun is marked. So it's probable that all those guns were here at Gettysburg, but that one gun with the mark on it, you can go read that and touch that, that was one of his. And that one was definitely here under Buford's command. Building off what Carolyn said, why did it even matter that this man would go to the records and search out and get the original pieces here, the original tubes? Because these men knew that they had done some extremely good work here at Gettysburg. Okay? And in the late 1800s, as these men are getting to be more Dan Hornberg's age, you know, a little long in the tooth, right? They're starting to realize that they want to commemorate the service they did here at Gettysburg and at every battlefield. So these monuments are not so much to themselves, they're to the valor of their regiments. And look what we did to save the Union. Okay, I would encourage you then, check out these monuments. This is John Reynolds. This is John Buford. Check out the field of fire. Don't get too far away. And then we're going to cross down to the John Burns marker down here. Can Carolyn? I just say one thing about personal experience for General Buford? You guys are going to do some Civil War medical here at Spangler Farm. This man here, he's 38, I think he's 38 years old. He's in his late 30s. He's got arthritis so bad, he can hardly get on his horse. And when he gets on his horse in the morning, he stays on that horse. He stays in the saddle. He's going to develop typhoid fever late fall of 1863, and he is going to die in D.C. Uh, in November 1863, typhoid. Let me translate. D.C., not D.C., <laughs> all right, just so you know. District of Columbia that wants to be a state. Um, he's, he's going to die. This whole area, you got to realize, 19th century, they don't understand germs. There's, the water is so polluted. We think our water is polluted, but when you bring a lot of people together, everybody gets sick from the water. Willie Lincoln's gonna die of typhoid in 1862. Prince Albert's gonna die of a typhoid in 1862. Um, McClellan is gonna get typhoid in 1862. And it's a deadly, sickening disease. Buford's not going to be able to fight it off, and he's going to die in November 1863, so he doesn't live long after the battle. Probable his health was compromised to begin with, but, you know, just some personal information about these guys. They were tough, but they were pretty much compromised if we talk about our health today. 38 years old, you can just about get on your horse from arthritis, and he's a tough, tough man. Kentuckian. Very good. Split state. Border state. Border state. So. All right, here we go. Well, here we are on East Cemetery Hill, Gettysburg, Pennsylvania. 
on the close of our second day of touring Civil War battlefields. Harper's Ferry yesterday morning, Antietam yesterday afternoon, and the full day at Gettysburg today and tomorrow. We have been graced with the wisdom of Carolyn Ivanoff, who is an um, expert on the 17th Connecticut and other Connecticut regiments. She has a home here in town and a home in Connecticut, and she has come here today to fill our minds with all kinds of good history nerd stuff. Behind me, to my left, you'll see Culp's Hill. It is probably one of the greatest controversies around surrounding Gettysburg that also addresses that hill. If you remember in the movie Gettysburg, those of you who have seen it, the enduring controversy that continues after Robert E. Lee is said to have told Richard Stoddard Ewell, take that hill if practicable. Practical means if you think you can do it. Now a couple of things we have to consider. First of all, is that the hill he was talking about, Culp's Hill? Because reconnaissance was done up there, and there weren't a lot of Yankees up there. However, Oliver Otis Howard is up here, and he has positioned this as a gun platform. We're surrounded by cannon up here. So one of the controversies is, what is the hill that Yule was told to take? Was it this cemetery, East Cemetery Hill? Was it Culp's Hill? Another controversy, what if Ewell had taken this hill? If he took this hill, the second part of Lee's directive to Ewell, let's call it discretionary order. Do this if you think you can do it. The whole thing actually reads like this. This is from Robert E. Lee's January 1864 report to Jefferson Davis, president of the Confederacy. The enemy gave way on all sides, was driven through Gettysburg with great loss. Major General Reynolds, who was in command, was killed. More than 5,000 prisoners, exclusive of a large number of wounded, three pieces of artillery, and several colors were captured. Among the prisoners were two Brigadier Generals, one of whom was badly wounded. That would have to be Barlow, wouldn't it? Our own loss was heavy, including a number of officers, among whom were Major General Heath, slightly, he got nicked in the head, and Brigadier General Scales of Pender's Division, severely wounded. The enemy retired to a range of hills south of Gettysburg. That's where we are now. Culp's Hill is going to be what's called the Eye of the Fish Hook. Right this is the Fish Hook itself, and then the line runs along Cemetery Ridge to the Round Tops. That's the high ground that Lee just described in his report to Jeff Davis. The enemy retired to a range of hills south of Gettysburg, where he displayed a strong force of infantry and artillery. It was a certain from prisoners we had been engaged with two corps of the Army, the 1st and the 11th, formerly commanded by General Hooker, and that the remainder of that army under General Meade was approaching Gettysburg. Without information as to its proximity, the strong position which the enemy had assumed could not be attacked without danger of exposing the four divisions present, already weakened and by a long and bloody struggle to overwhelming numbers of fresh troops. Translation, what if they took this hill? What's on the other side of it? If two corps of the Army of the Potomac, the 1st Corps and the 11th Corps, were present north of town, where's the rest of the Army? Without his cavalry here, his eyes here, Lee was essentially blind. And so he doesn't know what's behind Culp's Hill. The Baltimore Pike is a main artery. He knows Union troops are on it, but where? And so when he says, I can't expose those battle-wearied soldiers to a possible attack by fresh soldiers, that's what he's saying. General Ewell was therefore instructed to carry the hill by the enemy. Carry the hill by the enemy if he found it practicable, but, and this but part is never mentioned, but to avoid a general engagement until the arrival of the other divisions of the army, which were ordered to hasten 
forward. So the big controversy is, why didn't Ewell take that hill? Because I don't think it was that hill he was supposed to take. He was supposed to take the hill where the enemy were. Look around you, cannons everywhere. The enemy was here, possibly, okay? Secondly, he didn't know it was on the other side, did he? But that last part of Lee's discretionary order, take the hill if practicable, but do not bring on a general engagement. If the Yankees are sitting on this hill, how in the world can you take the hill? Are you gonna politely ask them to leave? They're not gonna do that. And so, Ewell takes a big hit in his reputation for not taking this hill. And everyone likes to say, well, if Stonewall Jackson would have been around, he would have taken that hill. Well, Stonewall Jackson's dead. He's not even in play. So bringing up Jackson at that point is, is kind of ludicrous, isn't it? You're here with the commanders you have. Jackson's Corps has been divided into two under Ewell and A.P. Hill. A.P. Hill is sick. Ewell is exhausted, and his men do the best job they can possibly do to take this hill, including a fight up here on, the, on July 1st. One of the units that tried to take this hill is going to be the Louisiana Tigers. Uh, remember early in the war, they wore those striped pantaloons. I have that uniform that I'll never wear to school because I look like a clown in it, okay? But by this time, they're long wearing those uniforms. They're shot. They're clothed more like regular Confederate infantry. They swarm these hills. There are going to be knife fights because they carried bowies among these cannon. If you look around you, you see these half moons that encircle the cannons? They're called lunettes, okay? Basically, they protect the, fire, the soldiers from fire who are manning the cannons from the upward shots down below. And again, does ground matter? Is this high ground or what? It's deceptive because coming through town, there's such a gentle slope. But you get here and there's a drop off. Again, Culp's Hill will be the barb of the fish hook. This will be the top of the fish hook and the line's going to extend clear down to the round tops along Cemetery Ridge. You want? I think you can hear me. Um, I don't think it's going to be a problem with the microphone. Look around you. I mean, this is commanding ground. Gettysburg is the Three Hill, Hope Hill, East Cemetery Hill, and Little Round Town. Three big, important hills. I want to say something about this position. It is. view shed here this way but this way is some of the most churned up land in Gettysburg nothing like its 1863 appearance there are two schools there there's sports fields there's um, uh, parking uh, so most of the land is covered up if you were here in 1863 you could see right out to Oak Hill where we we just were you could see right out there if you were here in 1863 you could see town right there along High Street. Beautiful. In fact, the guys that are imprisoned in the school on High Street are going to watch this night fight on the second. But this position is a little iffy because we talked about the military crest of a hill. And if you notice where the guns are, you can't see what's below you. You can see the 17th Connecticut or the 54th New York or what's going on down there. And on the night of July 2nd, it's going to be a real battle. Now, there's a lot of problems during Civil War with night fighting. One of the reasons they don't do it. Well, you can't see. And Victorians who are vitamin deficient, especially vitamin A, many have night blindness. And, you know, first of all, you can't see down below there. You can't see what's going up here. 
and it's a very, very difficult, difficult situation. So Louisiana troops, Harry Hayes troops, the Tigers, are going to come from this direction. And you're going to have Avery, Hoke's Brigade, Isaac Avery is going to be leading, is going to form up on the um, Culp Farm. The Louisiana Tigers are going to form up in town. And remember, they can see a long way here. They're going to attack, uh, well, first of all, during the day, there's a lot of fighting. You're going to hear the cannons rolling in from Little Round Top, the wheat field, the peach orchard, long streets of salt. There is massive, massive fighting on this field to the south. By evening, 4 o'clock, well, these guys think maybe they're all set until the artillery, the Confederate artillery, starts to fire from the hills, from Benner's Hill, from Oak Hill even, and it's going to converge up here. Now we already said we're not at the mil we're, at, we're not at the military crest, but we are at the top, and these guns are really suited for long range fire. And Union artillery is good, better than the Confederate. We're really making some hits. <coughs> long about dusk. Those guys, early boys, get orders. They're going to hit this hill. They form up in the streets, form up at the, at the um, Culp Farm, and they start coming. And the Union artillery is banging away, banging away tough position to attack. But the troops, like the 17th Connecticut, they're down there on what is now Wainwright Avenue. That used to be Weinbrenner Road, or Run, it was a farm wagon road that instead of those heavy farm wagons coming over the Baltimore Pike, they used to go take that farm road down there. They're not in a good spot down there. And they are going to be overwhelmed, and it's going to be very dark, and there's flashing and thundering of the guns, and just nobody can see. These guys, Ricketts Battery, Weedrick Battery, Weedrick is going to be overrun. The Confederates are going to swarm up here. If you look on the 73rd, uh, 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 73rd Pennsylvania Monument, you're going to see this night fight depicted. It's turmoil. Ricketts is going to come in where Cooper is. You see these guns here? That's Ricketts batteries. And they're going to remove guns and pull fresh guns in. And in that lunette right there, as they're parking a cannon, one of the gunners has to pick up a hand and fling it out of the lunette. So things are really, really rough up here. Howard is in the gatehouse. The command structure's in the gatehouse and the fight just convulses the hill. Now the gunners don't know it, but two regiments down here, the 75th Ohio and the 17th Connecticut, we're pretty sure they hold. But the New York boys buckle down here and the Confederates start to stream up. This down here where the water towers are along Baltimore, uh, along, um, Baltimore what happens is the Harry Hayes Tigers start pushing them this way. This is another one of those salients that we saw on uh, Barlow's Knoll. And uh, it's like an L, like the end of a triangle. And where the Confederates come in, in that vulnerable salient where there's a gap. And they start to swarm up this hill. And our 11th Corps guys, you know that crescent moon? They really take a beating, but they give a beating as well. They're tough. They have the name Howard's Cowards because at Chancellorsville, they're all the way at the end of the line and they get creamed. 26,000 guys roll over them at Chancellorsville. What happens at Barlow Snow? The same thing. What happens up here? They stick. But you know what? This dark hill is swarmed with Confederates. The estimate is, though, only 80 by less than 100. Confederates hit these guns, but it's hand-to-hand -hand fighting. Uh, one 
These are all German gunners. They don't get any respect in the Yankee army. But a Confederate officer comes up to one of these guns. I don't know which one it is. The, uh, the one of Ricketts guns. And he stands in front of the gun and he tells the gunners, I take this gun. And the guy says in German, you shall have it. And he rips the lanyard and it just blows this Confederate officer away. They fight hard up here. Hancock is over that way. He sees that there's some real problems up here. It's getting really bad at night. He sends in Carroll, Red Carroll's Gibraltar Brigade. It's three regiments here, the Indiana. They're gonna all storm through the cemetery. One of the regiments comes through the cemetery gates. Indiana, West Virginia, and the 4th Ohio. And they come in, what, uh, Indiana's gonna lose their color bearer. They come in and they help the 11th Corps push the rebels off these cannons. Now it's a good thing it's night because some of these guys, there's not too many up here, they don't get reinforcements. Rhodes is on Long Lane down there. He never makes it. Gordon is down there beyond the Culp Farm. He's supposed to reinforce them. Never, never come. He's held back by early. And so what they have is a tremendous breakthrough up here, but it's never reinforced. And you're not going to hold a hill like this with 100 guys. Had they been reinforced, had this hill been taken, I think we would have seen some of a different type of Gettysburg battle on the third day. Meade would not have been in that little white house on the 20 town road meeting with his generals saying to them all, do we fight or do we stay? He wouldn't even have that meeting. But the 11th Corps does excellent work up here and they never ever get credit for it. Red Carroll's brigade believes they did good work, but they believe for the rest of their lives that they saved the 11th Corps at Gettysburg. And I'm going to say, not so. The 11th Corps did a, well, I can't swear, but the 11th Corps did a, quite a job up here. And so look around. Um, again, remember it's nighttime. Can't see anything. Uh, flag bearers are going at it. People are getting blown away. It's hand to hand down there where the 17th and the 75th Ohio stick, it's hand to hand. One of the little captains from the 17th grabs this big rib and yanks them right over the stone wall. And uh, it's just chaos. But they do push them off. They do save the hill. By that time it's 10, getting on 11 o'clock at night, and the day is set up for the third day. By the way, I have something to say about July 2nd. July 2nd is the bloodiest day of the battle. It is the second bloodiest day in the Civil War after Antietam. And we don't hear about it. We hear about day one, and we hear about Pickett's Charge day three. But here's where it's happening. So thank you. Thank you to all the good 11th Corps guys who, who stuck it out and really made a difference for the Union here. Thank you. One of the things that uh, is often said is that Joshua Chamberlain, who self-promoted himself, fair to say? Yeah, you know what? I have a problem with that because, listen, the Joshua Chamberlain we know is from a fictitious work called The Killer Angels and a movie. Historical Joshua, fiction, yes. J Joshua Lawrence Chamberlain I was one of the great citizen soldiers of the Republic. And um, you know what? He lives a long life with a terrible wound. I won't get into that, but he lives a long life. He's also very eloquent. I mean, he writes words that people repeat for generations. And does he self-promote? I think they all do to a certain extent, but Joshua Lawrence Chamberlain lives to tell about it. David Ireland over at Culp's Hill does exactly the same thing on Culp's Hill that Chamberlain does at Little Round Top, but David Ireland doesn't live through the war. And Patty O'Rourke is going to lead the bayonet charge. There's two bayonet charges on Little Round Top that nobody talks about the second one because it wasn't in the book or the movie. But Patty O'Rourke, that guy that everybody rubs his nose up there, he's going to lead a bayonet charge down the front of the hill, and he's going to be shot in the throat, and he's not going to live to tell about it. 
So survivors write the history. Of course. Right. Or the winners. And um, a lot of historians are starting to do more interpretation on Culp's Hill and East Cemetery Hill. If you're really into thick books, Gettysburg Second Day or Gettysburg Day oh. 2 by Harry Fonts. Yeah. Excellent book for the action here. I plan on rereading it this summer yeah. uh, just because I want to know more. You find out you've been to Gettysburg a couple of times like I have, you know, coming from Wisconsin, being here 35 times maybe. I don't know anything. Okay, I really don't. I'm learning more all the time. And the goal of this trip for you guys is to kind of set that hook and maybe you want to learn more by the time we're done. So we're going to end it right here. If we take any questions, it'll be off camera. Reputation. I think it's Howard that chooses this ground. And there's a little bit of a controversy like, who's really the big gun at the Battle of Gettysburg? And I always say, look at Howard's horses behind and look at Hancock. And these two, after all these years, still can't face each other. So, but take a look at that 73rd um, Pennsylvania. It is such a magnificent depiction of the night. Just like it shows in the diagram, in the center of the line. Okay? As we move forward, you're going to find our line gets a little uneven. But try to stay shoulder to shoulder. So as we move forward, what's going to happen is I'm going to call out Kermit. And Kermit, I want you to go down like you're shot. If you're wounded, you know, get up on your knees and hold your shoulder or something. If you're dead, you're dead. That's up to you. Um, you're going to be in this, what is that, goldenrod? I, so I, I will not, it's not goldenrod, so you're okay, Aaron. I will not have you go down because you're suffering right now, okay? But your mom's going down. She's going to be one of the first hit. I am going to call Moses' name. When Moses goes down, the guy on his left arm should grab that flag. It should not hit the ground. It's going to be raised high. So Moses, as you go down, drop, put the flagpole, the butt of it on the ground, so the guy next to you has time to pick it up. Then you flop like a fish. As we're going forward, you've got to close ranks, okay? If the person to your left goes down, and the flag is this way, you've got to fill in that gap. If the person goes down, you, you fill in toward the flag. As the uh, casualties grow, Rufus Dawes, who is crossing that line, crossing the Chambersburg Pike, his horse goes down. His horse is shot out from underneath them. He kind of somersaults off of it, pops up with a, I'm okay, kind of comment. And he eventually is right next to his flags that goes into battle. Okay? Do you understand your assignment? No other questions about it, unless it's about what I just described. Kermit. When you are shot, you stay there. Because I want the camera to record your bodies lying on the field. If you're wounded and you're flopping, that's okay. That's going to matter especially for the survivors who get to the railroad cut. So we're staging a play here, okay? Willie. Stay or stand? You may stay here. Dave, what if we keep everybody, sorry, just what if we keep everybody from where that starts? I'll yeah, we, we, we can do that. Then grass shouldn't fuck the kids, should they? So what we're going to do is try to keep Dan had an idea to stay this side of the yellow, okay? When we get near the monuments, though, survivors are going to have to peel to the right of the monument. There won't be many of you left by that time. When I shout a line on the colors, repeat after me, boys and girls. The flag surges forward. And eventually our lines take up a V formation. Okay? So it'll be forward. I'll start calling names off. When the when the line gets thinner, I'll shout a line on the colors. That's where 
you tighten up like I described, and the flag goes forward. Moses, you're not going down till that happens, okay? So give me a single file line case starting on the edge of the yellow. You don't have to go all the way back. Moses, you're dead center in the middle of the line. Ken, am I live? Say what? Am I alright if I'm in a shot? Yeah. Oh, I can be outside. Yeah. I don't want you in the yellow at all. Come up this way, and some of you might be in a little. You can see this tractor tire. We're going to follow that. Okay? So whoever is in the tractor path here, you're going to follow that right to the railroad cut if you're still alive. Trying to keep you out of the, the golden here, all right? All right, 10 on each side of Moses. We need more on the side of Moses. Try to be half and half. Try to stay together shoulder to shoulder so you're not running. You're walking at a steady pace. Are we clear? You don't need the paper in your hand. When I call your name, you drop. That's your decision. And we, when I see a line on the colors, then the V starts forming. Are we clear, guys? We only get one take. Don't do it. Then I don't care, I will laugh with you. All set? Look, Marshall, look, military. Forward! Stay together! Slow down, Mo. Slow down. Kermit! Ethan! Dan! A line on the colors. Step it up, Moses. Form the V. Form the V. Tammy. Caden. Be ready, Josie. Moses. Dress your ranks. Fill your lines. Andre. Josie. Forward, charge, charge, huzzah! Ten, you're hit. Okay, stop it. Lift that flag high. Look. Oh, Dan, I wanted you to be to the first, but I couldn't. How were my effects? I, like the, I was in front of you and I could hear your effects. I thought you went down like a girl. Okay, gather around, listen up. Okay, so that is approximately 175 paces. And again, service of the 6th Wisconsin by Rufus Dawes records what happened here. Um, the Iron Brigade stretched from where Mr. McCarty is right now and across the cut, and there is the monument to the 6th Wisconsin. That's all who was here. Why were they here? They were held in reserve in that low ground you can see right behind you, okay? You see the brick building? Go to the right of that in that low ground. They were held in reserve there because, again, nobody knew it was coming this direction. Information is so important. At the point where John Reynolds is shot and killed and Abner Doubleday takes over, the sixth is called into action. And there's a painting you're going to see in the Seminary Ridge Museum called We Have Come to Stay. A very boyish staff writer wrote up to Rufus Dawes. It was Lieutenant B Benjamin T. Martin of Major General Abner Doubleday's staff. Colonel, the young officer shouted, General Doubleday is now in command of the First Corps. He directs you to halt your regiment. So that's where they're held in reserve. 
Dawes quickly ordered his men down, and the Badgers flopped to the ground like Dan Hornberg, to the ground all sweat, chest heaving, and tangled equipment. In Company E line, raise your hand, who's got Frank King? Who's got Frank King? Okay, Andre. Frank King of Fond du Lac, shaken by a premonition, turned to Corporal Lyman White of Appleton. Lyme, this finishes my fighting. The corporal tried to make light of it, but later White remembered King's words because he dies here. Soldiers had these premonitions and his was one that came true. In the shade of the woods of McPherson's Ridge, the second and seventh Wisconsin, exchanged near muzzle to muzzle, ripping volleys with Archer's Brigade. The big lead bullets splintering trees and knocking men down in a thin swirl of chest high powder smoke. The Calico Boys, they call the 6th Wisconsin the Calico Boys because we were soft and needed to have soft cloth against our skin. They call the second Wisconsin something I can't repeat, but just use your imagination. They had been in service the longest, so the seat of their trousers were worn away. So they called them the ragged so-and-so second. And then, of course, they called uh, the Indiana troops the swamp hogs. And they called the seventh Wisconsin the feather bedders because they would take everything, including their feather beds, along on campaign, bless you. A staff officer rode up explaining that Lysander Cutler, who used to in the sixth, that his brigade across the pike was in trouble. And so, go as fast as you can, that's a paraphrase. It looks as though they're driving Cutler. And here are the words of um, forward, a line on the colors. This comes from Lance Hurtigan. And if I ever grow up, I want to be Lance Hurtigan to know what that man knows about the Iron Brigade. These are words taken again from Rufus Dawes, but written by my friend Lance. So picture from the fence to do the charge we just did. At the Chambersburg Pike, bullets coming in everywhere, thudding into the ground, splintering rails, ripping furrows in the meadow. This was the six Wisconsin men scrambled over the fence. The Wisconsin boys climbed over or knocked down the second fence, then stood and fired in the hail of bullets from the railroad cut 175 paces away. It was a galling fire, Albert Young said, a fire that is fast decimating our ranks. Several of our boys are left dangling in the fence. We are in a smooth pasture field now, but a few rods from the enemy, although only their heads are exposed, we open fire. Rufus Dawes said the fire was murderous, and to climb that fence in the face of such a fire was a clear test of metal and discipline. And here's the passage I'm especially interested in. The 175 pace from the second rail fence to the railroad cut was a swirling hell of bullets, smoke, shouts, and confusion. In Company C, the Jayhawkers from Prairie du Chien, Lieutenant Oren Chapman, who listened to a harmonica playing Home Sweet Home just the night before, was down and dying. Kate has Oren Chapman in the cemetery. On the left, the man who played it for them, who played the harmonica, Lloyd Harris, was struck in the neck by buckshot. In Company E, Amos Leffler of Eden was shot in the face and went down spitting blood and teeth. And Frank King of Fond du Lac took a rebel ball in the stomach and was left sprawled on the ground groaning in pain. The national flag went down, then up again. It fell a second time and a third. And Earl Rogers of Company I saw Dawes push forward at one point to pick up the flag. So a few more things to say here. First of all, nice work on the attack. This is a painting of what the fight here looked like. And you can see a Union soldier. His name is, uh, his name escapes me. How can that happen? Let's call him Frank Francis, okay? Um, Frank Waller, Frank Waller. And the man in the gray is uh, William Murphy of the second Mississippi. Capturing that flag was a trophy to infantry troops. So you can see what it looked like in the eye of the painter. 
This is Don Troiani. You can see the bridge isn't in the picture, obviously, okay? You can see how close up the fighting was. You can see, yes, it got hand-to-hand. -hand. In fact, Frank Waller is fist-fighting William Murphy of the 2nd Mississippi for control of that flag. When he gets a hold of it, he throws it down on the ground, stands on top of it, and keeps shooting off several more rounds. There was a New York regiment also involved in this fighting, and Frank Waller says that a New York man tried pulling the flag from underneath them to claim it as his trophy. Uh, no, that was not allowed. Frank threatened to shoot the man. Down in the railroad cut are Mississippi troops. They are led by Joseph Davis, the nephew of Jefferson Davis, president of the Confederacy. Did he get his command because he was a, a nephew? Was that nepotism that's called or not? But the troops who took this ground, they thought they had found a perfect defensive position. Look at it, right? Well, down that way a little bit, it might have been a better position because you could rise up and fire out of it. But down here, you can't fire from there. It's too deep, okay? So you follow the ground. Here is approximately correct yet. Um, you can see the rocks. That obviously was there. The bridge and its abutments are new. But instead of the defensive position they thought they had, this turned into a death trap. The Iron Brigade crosses the railroad cut and they're firing down the length of the cut. When Dawes gets here, he hops down into there and he demands a surrender of the Mississippi men. And the colonel of the Mississippi troops hands him his sword and surrenders. So on the day before his 24th birthday, Rufus Dawes leads the six from their holding position across the Chambersburg Pike, across that 175 yards where they're shot to pieces. And they take this position that really looks pretty significant. 200 men surrendered to Dawes. And when they surrendered, rumor is there wasn't a single loaded musket in the entire six Wisconsin. So they took them back under guard with muskets that were unloaded. Took them back this way into town. Eventually the fallback position for the 6th is going to be on the ridge to the left of the railroad cut. And July 1st they're going to have to retreat through the town. Remember Private Maloney of the 2nd Wisconsin? He's the one who captured Archer. He's killed in the later fighting. He doesn't get to enjoy the fact, yeah, I captured a Confederate general. Amos Luffler lost his lower jawbone and seven, eight, or nine teeth in that bullet that went through his jaw. He survives. I believe he was listed among the missing in action on July 1st, but eventually he makes it back. He lives and he actually farmed land at the end of sunset, right off of where your, your parents lived and where Janessa and Dale live now. His farmland is still there, and in 2006, a good friend of mine named of all things Larry Leffler, the great grandson of Amos, walked that ground. Larry never knew that his, his uh, great grandfather, great great grandfather, was a landowner. He thought he was a hired hand who'd moved here from Toronto, signed up to go fight. Paul's question were all these people from the area? Well, Amos had just moved in to be a hired hand and he signed up to fight for our country. He looked at that as a, a passport, in a sense to become an American citizen, possibly. After the war, he lives. He used to be able to tell when the weather was about to change. His wounds ached so badly. Eventually, he moves out to near Fremont, Nebraska, where he dies in, I believe, 1906. But his wounds, apparently, they had a prosthetic, a rubber face prosthetic, facial prosthetic, that could have been used to hide his wounds when he went in public. But how do you hide a wound that had to be that ghastly if it blew so much of your lower jaw away? Chin was gone, things like that. Okay, this is why the 6th Wisconsin Monument is planted in this location. This is the New York Regiment that was with them fighting. Were they the Brooklyn, the 147th? Over that way. Okay. Oh, one of the New Yorkers who tried to pull that flag of underneath Frank Waller, those guys, huh? So, here's the action that happened here, and the Iron Brigade earns 
its reputation as one of the fiercest fighting regiments. There's a book called Fox's Regimental Losses, and they put three of the Iron Brigade regiments, I believe, the second, the sixth, and probably the 24th, but I'm guessing there, in the top five for regimental losses because they just wouldn't quit. Again, is it because they thought they had something to prove as all Western? I'm not going to say it's because they were any braver because everyone who was here in the field has to be given that tag as being brave troops. Any questions? I either did that well or you're completely bored out of your minds. Which one is it? Well, Ethan. Um, what else happened because I uh, went down like Ethan. Okay, when you went down, Ethan, the surviving troops got to the railroad cut, and that's where I just told the story of what happened here. Okay. Other questions? It'll be on video. Oh, yeah, you're gonna be if not, we have one last stop before lunch. We're going to go to that tall hill over there called the Peace Light. When we get up there, you're going to see this laid out in front of you like a game board. And you can see how, as the troops here are breaking, it's because of massive pressure coming in from the north. Now, Carolyn has a couple things to add. Give her your attention. I just want to talk about the dead for the kids that were casualties. There are dead all over this field. They do try to recover them. The Union first in 63 and 64, they all go to the National Cemetery. But nobody wants the Confederate casualties in the cemetery. So if they uncover, that's a whole story in itself. So if they're going along the battlefield trying to uncover the dead, if it's a Confederate boy, they just close them right up. The Confederate casualties, the Confederate dead don't go home till 1873. Now, there are estimated 800 to 1,000 uncovered, unrecovered dead on the Gettysburg battlefield. The last full body to be recovered was 1996 in this railroad car. And somebody, it was a wet spring. So you see how crumbly the bank is? I guess some mud slid down and somebody was down there and saw a bunch of long bones. Now listen, when you see long bones, you either think deer or human. And they do recover quite a bit of bones on the, on the battlefield, but they're always tested. So this man reports to the rangers, they come down here, they look at it, and they recover almost a complete skeleton uh, with a mini ball underneath them that probably killed him. And they do some forensics on it, and it turns out to be like a 22, 23-year-old Confederate boy. Totally unknown. They inter him with honors in the National Cemetery. So just think when you're walking on this ground, you're really walking on the ground. So I'm not the only history nerd in the world. Are, are you history nerdier? Eh, you don't like that term? Yeah. Any other questions? Otherwise, we'll head back to the van.